Hi, um, this video is less of a demo and more of just a piece of scientific curiosity. Um, just think I'd mix it up a little bit and uh, avoid getting stale and boring. So I'm teaching a course at the moment, it's a third year um, physics course on solid state physics, which is basically trying to understand how solid materials work. And um, when, you, when you do a subject like solid state physics, you start looking at, for example, crystal structures. And so atoms in a solid will pack together into quite regular structures sometimes. Um, this is a model for a crystal of um, table salt, sodium chloride. And so you can see you've got sodium atoms and chlorine atoms and they'll form this sort of regular cubic array of sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine and so forth. Okay. And so if I sort of rotate it around, you can see it in various different dimensions. Now, the interesting thing about uh, these um, crystalline materials is that um, the reason why they stick together is that you have one with a positive charge and one with a negative charge. And because uh, like, uh, opposite charges attract, they will try to pull each other to, to, together. And so these structures tend to do what's known as close packing. What they try to do is get all the atoms as close as, as possible together. Um, so that they can cut down their potential energy by having uh, opposite charges close together. Okay, now there's a little bit of repulsion because this negative charge is going to want to keep that negative charge um, due to the chlorine nearby away, but the dominant term here is this attraction. Okay, so these materials tend to close pack. And so you have a thing in these crystals that's called the packing fraction, and basically if you take some piece of this lattice, for example you can imagine this cube on the corner, it's going to have a volume of, um, say this distance is x, x times x times x, which is x cubed, and you can assume that uh, each of these individual atoms are um, spherical balls that can get as close as possible to each other, they'll pack as close as possible, and you can then take that cube, x cubed, and you can work out how much of that cube is filled by atoms, right? So you can imagine if you've got spherical objects and they're packing together, you'll have a little bit of space in between. Um, if you want to go home and get some tennis balls or some oranges and stack them up, you can try this for yourself. And so the interesting thing about packing fractions is that um, it sometimes allows you to do really rough calculations of some of the properties of solids. So for example, you can take something like aluminium and assuming that it forms a particular um, crystal structure and knowing the size of the atoms and the distances, the separations between the atoms when they form a crystal, you can get a pretty good estimate of what the density of aluminium is and so forth. Okay, And so what I've decided to do is have a bit of fun with my third year um, solid state class. They're going to learn about packing fractions and crystals today and I'm going to throw them a challenge uh, for the next week. And so the challenge is the old classic problem of uh, guess how many M&Ms are in the jar and you can win the jar, right? And so if you think about this problem, it's actually rather difficult. I mean, we all did it when we were five, six, seven years old in school and you'd have your guessing competition, you'd go and you'd look at the jar and you'd go, wow, you know, there looks to be a lot of M&Ms in there. And some of the smart people might even go, well, I'll see if I can count them on the outside and work out how many M&Ms are in the jar. And that's really tricky. Um, and you'll probably get the wrong answer and you can come up with some even more advanced techniques if you want to but ultimately it comes down to the same issue that we had in the crystal it's one a packing fraction and so if you happen to know what the packing fraction for M&Ms is all you need to know is what the volume of one M&M is and the volume of the container that they occupy and you can make a pretty accurate calculation of how many M&Ms are in the jar. Okay so the way I solve this problem is that I can measure the volume of the jar. What I can do is just fill it up with water, pour the water out into a measuring cylinder and measure how much water is in there. Okay, so the jar, just for everyone here, has, it's a litre jar, but if you account for the fact that the litre graduation only goes up to here, there's actually 1,150 mils inside the jar. Okay, a pretty precise number. You can then need to work out the volume of one individual M&Ms. And um, there's two ways to do this. One is a rather destructive way, which is you take a um, beaker of water in a measuring, or you take a measuring cylinder filled with water and you put an M&M &M in there and you watch how much the water rises and that tells you the volume of one M&M. &M. And not only is that not very accurate, but it also makes the M&Ms not terribly edible. So um, 
to increase the accuracy you can put more M&Ms in there but that's just a bad thing to do because then you're just not just throwing away one M&M you can't eat, you're throwing away a whole packet. So a more fun way to do it is that you get a packet of M&Ms and you get out a pair of vernier calipers and you measure the dimensions of each particular M&M, right? Measure the, the diameter in one direction, the diameter in the other direction and you can calculate its volume, it's just what's known as a oblate spheroid and instead of being a sphere where the volume is four, four thirds pi r cubed, for an oblate spheroid it's four thirds pi a squared b where a is the big radius and b is the small radius, okay? It's just an ellipse. And so this is really good because what you can do is for each M&M that you measure the volume for you can then have it in an edible state at the end of it and of course you've got to develop some st statistics so why measure one when you can measure and eat 20 of them? It's fantastic, it's a great idea. So anyway you come out the end of this knowing that an M&M um, has a volume of about 0.7 of a mil and then if you happen to know the packing fraction for M&Ms you're in business. Now the packing fraction for M&Ms is actually a really tricky thing because they pack completely randomly and so if I hold this nice and close to the camera you'll notice that there's not really any sort of clear structure to the way the M&Ms pack inside the jar as there would be if you have a look for example inside this nice sodium chloride crystal. And so it's actually a, a re reasonably interesting problem in terms of thermodynamics and whether you can have thermodynamically stable glasses and so forth. I won't get into that too much. But uh, there was an interesting paper done on this a couple of years ago um, by um, Professor Paul Chaikin's group in uh, New York University. And what they did was they looked at um, improving the density of jammed disordered packings using ellipsoids. And so it sounds like a rather technical um, sounding article, but what they actually did was just work out what the packing fraction for jars filled with M&Ms are. And so if you happen to do your homework and a little bit of research, you'll find out that their experiments yielded a packing fraction of 66.5% to um, almost 1% accuracy for regular M&Ms and so if you take the fact that this jar has a volume of uh, 1150 mils and one M&M is uh, 0.715 and a packing fraction of 66.5% you calculate that there should be around about 1070 M&Ms in the jar and so the other Saturday night um, as a little sub-experiment of my own I actually had to count the M&Ms in this jar so that I know exactly how many are in there and some of you would say well hang on Adam you're being silly why don't you just measure the mass of this thing and that's actually a really tough problem because the mass of this thing all up is nearly two kilos and the mass of one M&M is less than a gram so I need to find a scale with uh, you know parts in 10,000 accuracy and they're really expensive and difficult to find so it was simply much easier just to count a thousand M&Ms and so there is actually a thousand and seventy two M&Ms in here. So now you can go and uh, start sharking M&M contests because in order to win the M&M contest you only need to know one thing, right, which is the volume of the jar because you know the volume of an individual M&M and you know the packing fraction and as soon as you know the volume of the jar because they pack randomly the structure doesn't even matter and so you can get pretty accurate guess as to what the number of M&Ms inside the jar is. Anyway, this is the challenge for my students and I've decided to make it a little bit tough for them. Um, it's not just going to be the usual game of place your guesses and whoever gets closest to the number of M&Ms in the jar wins the jar. It's going to be one of they kind of have to get it within a certain accuracy in order to be able to win the jar. So they have to guess to within plus or minus five M&Ms in order to win the jar of M&Ms. And if no one manages to get within five, then whoever gets the closest will win the booby prize, which is just a small pack of M&Ms, okay? But anyway, um, I hope to hear a couple of stories from people sharking their local guess the number of M&Ms contest in the, in the near future. Perhaps you might even want to share some with me and uh, just a little bit of fun and a bit of scientific curiosity.